Hi there, welcome. This is a tarot reading for Pisces for December 2018. That is Ascendant, Moon, or Sun in Pisces. And I'm using the Jaminee Tarot spread as I've been using for the rest of the videos I've made for this month. And if you want to learn more about that spread, please see my video on it in my channel. Otherwise, we're just going to get right into it here. Pisces, this is going to be your ascendant. This is always where the sign Pisces is in this particular spread. And then we move clockwise around one card for each astrological house. And we've got the 13 card in the center here that sort of ties everything together and from which everything sort of emanates from. So let's do a little bit of an overview here first. We've got quite a lot of major arcana. Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five six, seven. Seven out of 13 cards are major arcana. That's a lot of powerful energies going on, a lot of change. I think this is the most since, um, most major arcana for this month since Virgo. I think Virgo might have been eight, but nonetheless, they are very close in number. And it kind of makes sense because they are signs opposite one another. So naturally, um, you know, they probably are going to share something in common. And we even saw that with uh, Libra and Aries for this month, for example, sharing the center card in common. And there were a couple other spreads, too, that had um, justice at the center, for example. So when things like that happen, um, those, those signs might be linked in some way this month. And so it could be good to go check out my other videos and see if the center card is the same or the ascendant card, meaning the card for your sign is the same as any other uh, spreads for other signs, sorry. Um, but basically, um, yeah, when you have this many major arcana, it's quite a lot of powerful energies going on that can precipitate a lot of change or a lot of major shifts and whatnot within life for you this month. Now, obviously, this is a, this is a broad reading, right? It's a general reading for everybody who has sun, moon, or ascendant in Pisces. So you have to take that with a grain of salt because unless other things in your life are complementing what I'm saying here, it's not going to be as relevant or as powerful for you during this month, you know, which means there might not be like huge changes. Okay. If, if it's not supported by something in your own life. And, and what I mean by that is like, if you had a personalized reading by me or somebody else and, and it was a similar kind of thing coming up, or if your astrology chart is signifying a lot of powerful shifts and changes this month and so on, your, your actual astrology chart, not, not like a general horoscope. <clears throat> so yeah, just, you know, we, and we've got, yeah, we've got some heavy, we've got some heavy cards here. I mean, we've got the devil, we've got death. Devil is opposite the lovers. So there's this extreme kind of polarization between like love and hatred or like sex and bondage or pleasure and pain um, or, you know, passion and guilt, things like that. As we'll, and we'll see more, we'll understand that more as we delve into the spread and see what it holds. Um, yeah, we have, uh, we have the death card right next to the devil card. That's quite interesting Two very uh, powerful cards that often have to do with radical change. And, you know, the sort of the unknown or darker portions of life right next to one another. So kind of a major empowerment happening in this region. And this is the, um, let's see, this is the, the ninth house and the eighth house. So eighth house and ninth house. So actually, just like the sign Virgo, I believe, uh, for this month in the spread, death is again in the eighth house for both of these signs. That's quite an interesting coincidence <laughs> quite interesting um yeah they're both going to have the potential for powerful powerful transformation of course this month so that's that's quite that's quite awesome really in the truest sense of the word awe inspiring awesome so let's look at what else we have we've got one two three swords cards okay so the swords are going to be kind of they're going to be maybe the, the conduit or the what's surrounding these energy shifts, basically. That's really, really intense stuff, especially since we have 
two rather challenging swords cards here. This one is more neutral. And then we have one cups card, which is um, kind of strange for Pisces in a sense because it's it's just one cups card and Pisces is so watery. But we've got the moon in the middle, which is a very Piscean card. So we've got some water by extension. Also the high priestess is very watery, uh, but not a lot of uh, water. And then uh, only one pentacles card and only one's, one wands card. So we've got all the elements represented, all the sweets, but it's really mostly swords next to major arcana, which is going to tell us something important, I'm sure. Um, something I haven't been doing, but I probably will do it in the future more, is that uh, since Pisces is the 12th sign, we should also look at the 12th house from Pisces. And we should really, I should really have done that for every sign, but I didn't think of it till now. So, you know, for like Sagittarius, I should have looked at the ninth sign from Sagittarius or something like that. Um, you know, for, uh, for Aries, I would probably look at the 10th house since 10 is one again on another level. But, um, yeah, that's something for me to play with in the future and, uh, something for you to play with too. If you like this spread and you do tarot and you want to, you want to practice with this spread, it's, it's so far, this spread has been really rich and rewarding and I just created it like a week ago. <laughs> so I've, I've had the idea for it for a while, but I just recently created it. So we're going to, we we are going to do that though. We're going to pay some attention to the 12th. Um, partly because too, this is a very Piscean card. This is a much more naturally Piscean energy than the queen of pentacles, which is in the ascendant. So this is kind of a strange situation, I think in some ways, but we've got this lunar energy here with these two cards and, um, yeah, let's just sort of get to it. You know, let's just, just ju jump into this and see what we can find and whatnot. So we've got the moon as the common thread through everything, right? The moon is telling me that, uh, you know, you're going to be perhaps even more psychically open this month than you normally are. And that kind of buried beneath the surface of what's going on for you this month is a kind of a learning to sort of a, a sense or a learning to like really see things how they really are seeing beyond the veil, beyond the mundane, you know, actually seeing what is energetically real. And that can be a very challenging thing, which is maybe why the moon card is sometimes very difficult because if you think about it, um, as we start seeing beyond the veil and as we start seeing what's real instead of what we think is real, right? It can bring, it can bring up a lot of emotional sort of difficulties because we, we might be attached to something, you know, and when we, uh, to a perception of something rather attached to a perception of something. And when, when we see what it really is, that can kind of become spoiled and whatnot. Um, it's kind of this theme of like, you know, during a, let's say during a full moon, or sorry, let's say you go out into the woods when it's dark and you know, you see this really scary, like winding passage, right? But then you go there during the day and it doesn't look so bad. Well, finally the full moon rolls around and you go back there and you realize like that it's, it's kind of in between what you were seeing at night and what you were seeing at day. It's, it's not quite as bad as you thought, or it's not quite as scary as you thought or as dark as you thought. And you, you're seeing it in like a different light. You know, you're, you're not seeing it uh, in the daylight where it's like there's less room for kind of seeing beyond the veil. You're seeing it in the night, but with the reflection of the sunlight. So you're seeing it, um, you're seeing it in a way that might allow you to tune into what lies behind it kind of a, sorry, kind of a complicated example, but it's, I think I'm just trying to emphasize it's about seeing things for what they really are. And the moon also can indicate just sort of emotional turmoil in general as well. So there may just be emotional turmoil underlying everything and, and a sense of vulnerability and um, a sense of kind of being alone or that sort of a thing. But it's a great opportunity this month to really just be more honest with yourself, I suppose, is what I would say. Just be more in tune with your feelings, you know, 
to get more in tune with your feelings for sure and not be so ruled by your ideas, which is a very swords kind of thing happening, right? Like just be, be, you know, be naked. The, the moon comes after the star card. And I always wonder, is the star card the one that's, you know, watering this pool of water that we see here and that kind of thing so that the creatures, the sort of like lesser creatures or downtrodden people who are suffering and whatnot can have an opportunity of some sort to find nourishment is the, you know, is the lobster coming out of the water to sort of tell these two feisty dogs that are barking incessantly or whatever, like, Hey guys, like, um, you know, there's nourishment here. Like the, the moon is just trying to show you the nourishment or whatever. I don't know. I'm kind of getting way out there, but there's sort of all these themes coming forth and, and it's interesting stuff too. The, um, the queen of pentacles is the ascendant here, which shows like kind of, um, you know, having a lot of abundance, but also sort of like brooding over what to do with it and maybe feeling a bit stifled and trapped by it. Pisces really wants to be more in this 12th house anyway, which is more natural to it. Um, and so it's kind of wondering like, how can I take what I have and, you know, do something more profound with it maybe, or tap into some more profound sphere of wisdom and consciousness and all that kind of a stuff, all that kind of stuff, you know, um, the high priestess here is speaking to me as something a bit more primal and even innocent, even though it usually is more conceited or even, um, traditional, not necessarily conceited, but I have seen the high priestess show a very conceited kind of scenario. Uh, we'll, we'll probably find out more about that as we go on. It's not super clear to me yet, but it's interesting too, that, um, because of the way it came out in the spread, the pillar, uh, Boaz of these two pillars, which is basically the left pillar or the pillar, um, sometimes called the pillar of severity, but it's really just a feminine principle. It's just a feminine principle. This is what she's dwelling on. And, you know, the feminine principle is much more nurturing and receptive, generally speaking. But it can also be extremely ferocious and powerful too. It's not, it's not receptive in the sense of being passive. It's receptive, you know. Real receptivity is, um, is 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 very powerful. It's very powerful, and it's not, it's not um, limp. Is what I'm trying to say. It's not impotent by any sort of means. So, there is. Um, there is a, a very feminine emphasis here for Pisces this month, which negatively could be too passive, of course, and it could be too inside, too indwelling. And so we sort of do see a lot of like inner turmoil here, generally speaking, especially with, um, if we go like this card, the moon, the high priestess, the nine of swords, and then the eight of, of cups, you know, that's kind of a lot of turmoil happening. And then they're preceded by these cards. So we have quite a lot like, Wow, actually, oh my God, except so if we go all the way back to the three, right, these are all kind of cards of inner turmoil, and they all build up and culminate with this queen of pentacles who's worrying, worrying, worrying about money or about their place in the world. The pentacle they're holding is perhaps the moon itself. So again, this is um, wondering what to do with emotions and emotional turmoil and um sort of ghosts of the past and things like that. A lot of ghosts of the past sort of haunting the person and whatnot. Very interesting. Wow. But uh, with the high priestess in the 12th, there's a lot of capacity for some kind of spiritually illuminating scenario, I think. Uh, but that's very general, of course. Maybe I'll have more to say on it as we continue through the spread. This is a very intense spread, though. There's a lot of loneliness. There's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of sadness, honestly. I'm, I'm not going to lie. It's, uh, it's one of the sadder spreads I've done for this month, and it is kind of, uh, it's kind of moving me and whatnot. I'm looking at it and feeling, really feeling it right now. But we'll find the silver lining. You know, no, don't worry about it. Don't be too sad. We'll find the silver lining. <laughs> <laughs> there always is one. So uh, what is she aspected by? The Page of Wands, the Hermit, and the Eight of Cups. So again, we've got with these two cards kind of a theme of dissatisfaction, of sort of feeling lonely, which 
you know, adds to this theme we already saw here and to the moon theme and whatnot. So yes, kind of a feeling of loneliness and trepidation about the future and whatnot, but the opportunity to move on emotionally is really, is really present and possible. And the opportunity to really shed light on your past and understand it in light of wisdom is also really possible. I mean, these two cards did come up upside down, so there may be a bit, again, a bit of a trepidation surrounding that, doing that, but that's okay, you know? Um, it's perfectly okay. It's, it's just something to be aware of, right? We're just looking at the pattern. This isn't fixed or set in stone. And so that's why with reverse cards, I always like to give I give the other side of the coin. It's, it's, there may be a blockage in doing that, but that blockage doesn't have to be by any means permanent. And the, you know, this is indicating it's the 10th house of actions and fame and career. And it's kind of indicating like, as the person moves on to this new sphere, they're a little worried to say the least. They're, they're a little pessimistic about what that's going to entail and that maybe there's going to be failure or just, a lot of grief or guilt or something like that. I don't really know why it's, it's kind of, it's kind of an interesting one, you know, maybe we'll find out why that is as we look at these other cards. The page of wands aspecting is actually, um, I think one of the more positive things. It, it definitely shows like a friend or a, um, or, or even a partner or anything like that, that could be sort of, um, you know, looking at things more optimistically for one, looking more at the bright side of things, but it, you know, in, inside you, it, it's in the fourth house. And so it represents that there is this very optimistic explorational attitude emerging within your private life. And there's a lot of like fun and adventure to be had. But again, it's sort of getting drowned out by the fact that it's aspected by these two very serious, somber cards, you know, it's this kind of like worrying mentality and whatnot that I think you have. Um, and so that's going to kind of drown out that, that voice of, um, of risk, that voice that uh, can help you tap into your own talents and power and energy in, in a sort of more youthful, pure kind of way. So you should keep that in mind too. Like there is, th this is definitely one of the best cards here, I think. Um, it's the, one of the most empowering cards for sure. Definitely. Um, and what's interesting is uh, I'm going to have to do this pretty non-linearly, which is a very Pisces thing anyway, um, just being kind of all over the place all at once, like the ocean. Well, I was noticing the three of swords aspecting the nine. And it's funny because like normally you'd think that this is not like a good scenario, but oftentimes two negatives make a positive in divination and the three of swords is sort of like the ability to just like cut out the false heart the false heart is our is 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 like a metaphor for um the personality basically the attachments the definitions and whatnot uh, but really the emotional attachments the heavy nostalgia that like weighs us down and so this it card is actually um basically suggesting that you can get beyond this like grief and guilt and doubt by just sort of like cutting through this false heart and exposing the real heart, which is the soul in uh, certain Sufi mystical writings. The, the sun is related to the heart in the sense of like the soul self, the spiritual heart, whereas the moon is related to the external heart, the false heart, because it changes constantly like the phases of the moon. So this card is very much, cutting out that false heart in this context, at least with regard to aspecting this card. The lovers is also aspecting, which is rather strange, and the devil is aspecting. Again, another negative making a positive. The devil is the power to basically face your fears, you know, fully. And by facing your fears, you can conquer this grief, this hopelessness, this despair. Of course, facing your fears is oftentimes a very intense place, and it's a place that we have uh, trepidation about treading and so on and so forth. But um, yeah, the lovers aspecting aspecting it, uh, and by the way, this is your 11th house of hopes and wishes and dreams and friends, right? So 
this is not only showing friends having a hard time potentially, but also feeling, you know, literally hopeless about your hopes and dreams. And we should also look at the eighth house too, because the eighth um, in juxtaposition to the, the 11th is the eighth is like, can be like fear where the 11th is um, hopes, you know, and there's kind of that dichotomy of hopes and fears. And then the 12th too is sort of like what you need to let go of and, and how you're closed off to things. Whereas the 11th is like how you're open to things and, and what you'll gain as a result of being open. So it's just showing like not too much of an openness, but um, I think death in the eighth is very positive as well for facing your fears. Definitely, definitely positive for facing your fears and that sort of a thing. Coupled with the devil, you know, death can sort of destroy or trample the devil in a sense. It's like kind of a, a weird metaphor, but, you know, even this being is not immune to the cycle of destruction and renewal, basically, is kind of what this is saying. And so, yeah, you've got kind of a pessimistic attitude dominating your hopes and dreams, but you can cut it out just in one fell swoop. That's, that's the only way to deal with it, basically, is to cut it out of yourself and not give in to it, basically. You don't suppress, but you have to, um, you have to learn how to like see it as a falsehood so you can treat it as a falsehood, not treat it, treating it as a truth. And that's what this is really about. And then you can choose to like laugh at it or make light of it, which may be what the lovers is suggesting too. But on some level, the lovers and the devil may also be showing sort of like an attachment to this uh, because the lovers and the devil are in the third, ninth house area. And the third has to do with pleasures naturally. So this is like a lot of pleasure seeking and a lot of potential fun and stuff. Um, but it's oscillating back to this devil where there's a, maybe a feeling of guilt or being chained to that or something like an escapism mechanism and whatnot. And so um, in a sense, the lovers and the devil influencing this could also suggest that you're escaping from this into this sort of bouncing back and forth between extreme pleasure and extreme pain. So it's, it's quite interesting. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to that as we progress. It might become clearer. But yeah, cutting it out, cutting it out just in one fell swoop. Okay, so second house is reversed four of swords. Kind of an odd card to have in the second house. Um, you know, not necessarily too much happening or changing financially possibly some inertia financially, also with family matters. Um, you know, it's maybe sort of an inability to let things be laid to rest, whether it was a relative that recently passed or, um, or like a series of arguments or something, but like letting things be laid to rest. Let's see what's aspecting it. The devil, great. The high priestess and the three of swords. So, uh, just, I'm just going to think in terms of finances and support for a moment. Uh, you know, the devil aspecting that is kind of showing a bondage to it. You know, it can be a, a, an influence of bondage and suppression and sort of trying to control it too much, worrying about it excessively and, you know, feeling, feeling kind of like hopeless about it and that sort of a thing. The three of swords aspecting, well, we've got four and three, right? So <clears throat> the three of swords is kind of potentially influencing it, uh, influencing finances in a way where it's like making sort of premature, unenlightened decisions that can kind of, um, that, that are, hmm, maybe, maybe not actually. It's more, maybe it's more like there's a sense of like trying to fight against this. And so then this is, this attitude is stubbornly resisting this one. You know, it's like, so it's like trying too hard to sort of solve this problem or falling back into like old habits and being a little pessimistic since this card is reversed, meaning it's sort of in this case, falling back to the three. So there's some, some kind of theme of that. The high priestess is the strangest influence upon it. The high priestess is maybe, 
kind of this sort of mentality of, or, or possibility of like, or of like letting go of trying to do something about this, of trying to control it, the wisdom of just letting go and just being open and receptive to um, your problems being solved by a non-linear, non-rational approach. I think that could be a definite possibility there. All right, so yeah, we have the lovers, as I talked about a little bit already. It's aspected by death, by the emperor, and by the nine of sword so this is uh these are a lot of guilt factors to me surrounding uh pleasure and love and stuff like that there's just a lot of like guilt and suppression of it um you know it maybe a desire to like annihilate this or destroy it if you are um on the one hand yes okay like that that's not a bad thing like this this is kind of you know questionable but actually the lovers in the third is is kind of problematic because the third is so pleasure driven and the lovers is so pleasure driven and it could just be an unrealistic escape you know possibly escaping from this possibly escaping from this you know escaping from your problems and things into just pleasure and play and and whatnot and the emperor's here saying get your shit together right? Death is here saying, just destroy this. It's useless. You need to change this mentality of pleasure because it's unhealthy. And the nine is here saying like, shit, I know I need to do something about this. It's not quite right. It's not quite serving me. And of course the devil, even though he's not an aspect, he's the seventh house from the third. So this is the ninth house. The ninth is about God, spirituality, and religion. And so this is like a you know, it's kind of a God wrestling card. Um, definitely a God wrestling card. I would, I would recommend reading that myth in the, the book of, um, I forget which book it's in, but it's in, you know, um, it's in the quote unquote old Testament and it's like, uh, Jacob or, Oh gosh, I can't remember. I can never remember the names of these different Hebrew patriarchs, but it's, you know, it's one of these major Hebrew patriarchs that ends up, uh, God wrestling and then receiving the name Israel for wrestling the angel of God and Israel means God wrestler. So it would be a good, I think it'd be a good story to read in light of what I'm seeing here. It would give you some interesting things to think about, but this is a very like, I don't know. There's, there's some kind of negative influence in terms of how you're relating to the universe or the divine or just your purpose in life. If, if you're more of an atheist and you don't buy any of that, you know, like what you're here to do, what you're supposed to do, you're, you're not necessarily wanting to do it uh, this month. You're kind of, um, again, you're just like, you're stuck in this cycle of like guilt and sort of inertia, you know, you're frozen perhaps. And the emperor aspecting, it's kind of the only influence that's again saying like, get your shit together, <laughs> you know, be responsible and whatnot. But the emperor can also be adding to the guilt in the form of a um, achievement overachievement oriented mentality stemming from either your father or the society at large and whatnot. The emperor can also be a desire to control this stuff for yourself. So, so coupled with the devil, you may be trying to control energies that are not really for you. You know, the devil is more of an eighth house energy, which is um, un a dharma, undharmic. It's like going against your calling and your 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 purpose, and going against what we call God. So, being in the ninth, it's kind of like the eight, having the eighth house really influencing the ninth, overpowering the ninth, perhaps. And so, the emperor may represent desire to like really control these these forces and things that you can't really control, and are maybe better left not to be meddled with. Okay, so moving on, we already talked about the fourth house a decent amount. It's pretty simple. Again, it's that, you know, sort of explorational attitude that can allow you to go on a new adventure as a very positive card in the grander scheme of this whole spread. The emperor is the fifth house. So again, um, fifth house is, is naturally the house of power, actually, of of like individual power and of course, joy and creativity. 
It's a very empowering house. Whereas the eighth is empowering, but in relationship to other things. So it's a little bit different. This is just personal power. I'm going to do whatever I want. I don't give a shit. And that's kind of the attitude of the emperor here for you this month showing I I'm going to do whatever I want. I don't give a shit, but the high priestess is an influence that's saying respect the teachings, respect wisdom, respect women too. do not be a fucking dick basically and <laughs> just do whatever you want and mistreat women for sure. Because you may, you may even be getting a lot of a, fe a female attention this month if you're, um, if, you're, if you're somebody who's into women, especially if you're a man, because this is a very masculine card. You've got the lovers aspecting, the devil aspecting, you know. So possibly a lot of um, push and pull with like, you know, the realm of pleasures and attraction, right, will be influencing you or, or be being drawn to you, you know, as you get the people that you get this month or the situations that appear really like pleasurable are also going to bring their own challenges with them. And this pleasure could quickly turn to pain. If you're not aware of it, you become too attached to it, too enmeshed in it, which is easy to happen, right? If you look at things clearly, which again brings us back to the moon, if you really look at them clearly and you feel, you really feel into them and feel how they, they are rather than think how they are, you're going to find, Oh, Oh, okay. This person or this experience is um, definitely pleasurable, but I can also see that it's really going to also bring this challenge and maybe it's going to suck when it's over or, but you know what? I, yeah, I'll just do it anyway. And I know that it's going to transpire in this way and that's okay. I'm not going to be attached to it and, you know, having your guard up in a positive way, a positive aspect. And so the, the priestess is kind of the wisdom and respect there that's getting maybe lost in this powerful influence. And, you know, sometimes the emperor forgets his place and thinks he is, you know, superior to this primordial wisdom, which is not the case. So sometimes the emperor can dominate the priestess, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah, getting caught in the thick of things is uh, a very big possibility. So you ought to be aware of that for this coming month. Okay, where are we? Fifth house, sixth house, three of swords. Actually a great card to have in the sixth house. And actually the, the nine and the death card aspecting is, is, very, is very good because this means uh, overcoming obstacles, overcoming enemies, you know, powering through things and the definite ability to really refine yourself and to cut out the false heart that I talked about earlier. So that's really cool actually. That's a really positive thing you have going for you, even if it might be somewhat painful. And of course, this card of family and wealth and stuff, and it is signifying sort of a, an influence on this that's not so positive. It's more, um, it's more uh, attachment based, I think, you know, like not wanting to disturb the status quo, being afraid to just cut out what you don't need anymore. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of, the nine I kind of take it back. It's not necessarily that positive of an influence on the three. At first glance, it, it was because of the two negatives make a positive. But I think it's it's kind of, again, it's like, it's almost like worrying about if, if I cut out this stuff out of my life, um, this is going to be really sad and I'm going to feel sad. Eh, you know what? That's okay. It's okay to feel sad for, for a moment. You know, it's not the end of the world. You can feel sad and then you can move on from being sad. A lot of times we don't because we feel guilty. We feel like, no, I should be sad. I should be sad and, and I, I shouldn't be okay about this because our world is so messed up, to put it bluntly. <laughs> but yeah, the more you go, death is actually a really auspicious card here for you in the entire reading because the more you go into the unknown and the more you like allow the transformation to happen, the more you can get beyond like, you know, these obstacles or this um, pleasure seeking, fruitless pre pleasure seeking, and the more you can get beyond, um, uh, well, and the more actually this will open up, I think this will be sort of more complemented by death, but it can also mean like the dissolution of old values and ideas that are no longer really serving you, you know? 
the priestess can refer to that. And it is in the 12th house, again, something to surrender, something to give up, so to speak. Um, you know, this very exalted, perhaps this very exalted sense about spirituality and state of being and that sort of thing is something to give up. You know, it's not, it's not something unapproachable, unattainable, maybe even thinking that it is and whatnot. This is, in that guise, the priestess is a false idea of things. Okay, hermit in the seventh house. Not too much happening for your love life. Um, there's a pattern of like encountering lonely people or people who want to be left alone and sort of brood over things. You may, of course, have a tendency to be doing this as well with regard to your relationships and desires. There may be a sense of, am I going to be lonely forever? You know, if you haven't found the right person and that sort of a thing. So for you, uh, the hermit in the seventh is suggesting like really reflect upon really reflect upon your, your attitudes about relationships and sex and partnerships of all kinds, really reflect upon it, take the time to do that and then do something with that reflection. Don't just sit there and keep reflecting on it as the hermit is want to do, you know, the hermit will just sort of continuously search for the light outside of himself when he's actually just carrying it here. That's kind of the danger of the hermit. And, you know, in contrast to the queen here holding the um, the moon, maybe he is holding the sun. And we don't have the sun card here, but well, we do have uh, this sun. And we do have this sun rising over the, the horizon or maybe setting. I don't know. I always thought of this as rising, but it would kind of make more sense if it's setting. But it doesn't really matter. In any case, you know, he he's already got it right where he is, so to speak. And so with regard to relationships, um, you know, it, don't look, this is not the time to be looking outside yourself. This is a time to be contemplating your attitude to it from within and searching for that light within and not worrying about like finding a partnership or something like that. It's very unlikely to happen this month in general. Again, general, general, general readings. Um, Hermit is aspected by the page, which is going to signify kind of a reawakening to a more youthful way of being, which is cool. He's got his staff. The Hermit's got his staff. This staff is, you know, it has growth. It has growth. This staff has no growth. This staff is very ancient, very old. So there's this juxtaposition of the young and the old for you this month as well. And that could be, that could work out in your life. Uh, as well. If you're older and watching this, you could encounter some youthful, more naive individual that can reignite a spark in your life. If you're younger, you may find an older person who can like, may help lead you to, um, to a more empowered state and a more mature state, the page moving toward the emperor card. Uh, the nine here also aspects and, uh, or sorry, the eight, the eight, eight of cups. Also aspects, um, as far as love life and, and where you're going, again, this is kind of a, this is sort of like a bittersweet departure, but it is a departure. Um, this character is moving away from the hermit in terms of how it's laid out. So there's a bittersweet departure. On some level, you may know what you need to do, but again, hesitant to do it because of pessimism in the future. Okay. Um, yes, death card in the eighth. What's holding it back? Basically, sort of a dysfunctional false ideal about things, a, de a desire for pleasure, and for everything to be happy go lucky. And this is uh, actually more helpful to it. Yeah, the Three of Swords, again, cutting out the false heart, the big theme that we keep seeing here. And we, ha we even have the moon in the middle, right? And I talked about the false heart as the moon. So I didn't even, I didn't even realize I was doing that, uh, to be honest. Like, I, I didn't even see that link when I talked about that. It just seemed like an appropriate metaphor. So big theme of cutting out the false heart. That's kind of the message for you this month, for sure.
Ninth house, we already kind of talked about, right? Um, trying to control things too much, trying to fight against God, that sort of thing. Fight against your father, maybe. Ninth house has to do with the father. Ten. We didn't really talk about the ten. This is a transition for you in terms of career matters, in terms of responsibilities and your your greater actions in the world. This is a transition for you. Again, bittersweet. You're not very optimistic about it, but you have to make it anyway. And this card is reversed and surrounded by two very dark, fearful cards. So there's a lot of fear around this, but you have to make this transition in your life. This is a big, this is potentially a big change, actually. Again, because we have all these major arcanum, we have the devil, you're, you're escaping from a dysfunctional situation. You're moving on from a dysfunctional situation. Um, but you're you're blocked by this extreme trepidation and fear of the future and what will come and that sort of a thing. Um, much more in your mind than it is a reality. If you if you continue to think like this, even if you do manage to move on, things probably won't work out, and then you'll recede into a victim mentality and probably move backwards into the devil domain and sort of fall back into um, a dysfunctional mode of being. But on the other hand, um, you know, if you can, if you can let go of all this worry and being too passive, perhaps, you know, and being too obsessed with things, um, or it's too like too worrisome in general, right. Then that is the key to really moving on. And the, the, you know, the paths to do that are basically shown by death, right? Accepting the transformation of your life and not fighting it, you know, cutting out your attachments. And this can, this can also be done uh, more quickly by like shredding old papers that you don't need anymore, throwing away things, burning things that you don't need anymore and so on. That can be a good external method to do it. Um, you can do visualizations of moving on and things like that. And then I would say the other card that really is in your favor is the page of wands because the page of wands is again, a new, a renewal of a youthfulness that can happen for you. That's sort of just happening quietly right now and your unconscious is sort of slowly happening. The emperor is kind of neutral. It can be an empowering card for you. Like I said, you have a lot of, a lot more power than you think, but you're sort of wasting it in these areas, right? You're sort of like wasting it potentially. Um, and you're, yeah, you're kind of wasting it from the high priestess too, because the, even though I said a bunch of things about her earlier, I'm, I'm also getting the vibe that she could again, symbolize kind of like a, like an, just an old way of thinking about things like, or, or a, an attachment to tradition or a, or a sense of not wanting to take action with the power that you do have. And so then you're just escaping into this dichotomy of pleasure and pain. So the emperor, there's a lot of potential there and there's a lot of potential in the hermit card as well. A lot of potential in the hermit card to just, uh, you know, the hermit is at the very end of life, at the very end of a phase. And there's sort of these, these you know, you, this is about killing out the attachments to the past, which the hermit is something the hermit has to do. And this card is coming to sort of, um, you know, destroy the hermit, destroy this sort of old person within you. It's a mentality more than it is literal, right? It's an old, an old outmoded mentality within you. And, you know, the hermit is actually dying to be transformed the hermit is you know dying to be purified by the light of the sun and so on so really this is a welcome influence for the hermit and this is going so basically the direction you're heading in seventh house is is potentially going to radically change this month you know especially if you the more you open up to that it's really cool so i'm really excited for you even though this is a, in some ways a more somber spread than some of the other ones, but I'm actually really excited about it. And there's just tremendous, tremendous power and opportunity here for you. So please look at it that way. And I think you'll have a much better experience in this coming month. Okay. Well, that wraps it up. Please 
remember to like, subscribe to the channel, share this on Facebook, share it with all your friends, check me out on Facebook, Instagram, and of course visit my website for readings and materials on divination. Have a great month, guys.